Uh, good evening. Um, I'm back. We're going to go ahead and uh, get started with the presentation. Tonight's topic is wealth retention through proper year-end tax planning. Um, my name is Dmitry Fomichenko. I will be your host tonight, and uh, I'm the founder and president of Sense Financial Services. And uh, before we invite our guest speaker, I just wanted to take a couple of minutes to quickly uh, tell you about uh, what we do. I do see many clients joining us. I see a lot of familiar names, uh, but there are some of you who are uh, new. So I uh, just want to make sure you're aware of, of what we do. Uh, Sense Financial Services is a boutique financial firm specializing in self-directed retirement accounts with checkbook control. We've been serving our clients since 2010. Uh, I think we're doing a fine job and our clients love us because we're intentional about this. We have hundreds of five-star reviews on Google, uh, Better Business Bureau, Yelp, LinkedIn, and bigger pockets. Uh, we have assisted over 3,000 clients, established over 4,000 self-directed retirement plans, and most of our business comes through referral. Uh, as a company, our goal and our mission statement is to help our clients obtain control and protect their retirement accounts. Proverbs 21.5 says that good planning and hard work leads to prosperity. And uh, we know that you work hard for your money, so we want to come alongside you and we want to uh, help you on that uh, uh, road. And whether it's talking about how to utilize your retirement account in a wealth building or how to utilize your overall tax situation, that's what, the, again, the topic of tonight's uh, presentation that Tony is going to speak about. Uh, all, all of those tools that we want to make available for you and help you in your journey. Uh, the benefits of a self-directed IRA and self-directed solo 401k is that uh, these self-directed plans allows you to invest in alternative assets so that, that you can achieve true diversification. Investment returns are tax deferred when you're using traditional pre-tax account, or if you're utilizing Roth account, which you can as well, that means you have tax-free investing for the rest of your life. You can leverage your funds with non-recourse financing or non-recourse loans. So you can actually acquire real estate inside of your retirement account uh, and you can um, finance a purchase. You don't have to pay uh, just all cash. You, uh, we do provide you with the checkbook control uh, for your retirement account so that you can bypass the middleman, bypass the custodian in case of an IRA or completely eliminate custodian out of the picture with the solo 401k because custodian is not required. And solo 401k is a, a great tax shelter. Uh, currently for this year, you're allowed to contribute uh, up to $73,000 per year per participant. Just think about the if you're a uh, husband and wife in business together and you're jointly able to shelter close to $140,000 of your income, uh, look at your bottom line and then from that bottom line you subtract additional 140 grand what that's going to do to your uh, uh, how that's going to affect your taxes significant uh, tax savings uh, so you got to be looking at that if you're eligible uh, but th there's a lot of things you can do with self-directed retirement accounts but there's few limitations the, there is a certain things that prohibit it and those um, uh, uh, prohibited transactions described in the Internal Revenue Code Section 4975. And you're not allowed to invest in collectibles and life insurance contracts. And in addition to that, you're not allowed to engage uh, in a transaction using your retirement plan with a disqualified person. And disqualified person is uh, yourself and your immediate family members. Uh, this uh, cartoon, I think, uh, a credit goes to my daughter, which is uh, amazing. She was uh, uh, probably in uh, uh, fourth or fifth grade when she uh, did this cartoon for me. And uh, we just toured the, the college today. Uh, time flies so quickly. But uh, man holds the basket, with, which represents a stock market. And the eggs um, are uh, all broken because the bottom fell off. And wife is confused, saying, well, I thought that our investments were diversified. Well, guess what? If you are just in one uh, asset class, 
that means you have all of your eggs in one basket. You do not need to diversify it. Ecclesiastes 11.2 says, divide your portion to seven or even to eight, for you do not know what misfortune may occur in the earth. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow or next year. Uh, you, you've probably been around long enough and you've seen what happened in the past. Just take a look at the 2000 at the beginning of the pandemic and the, the effect on the stock market. Go back to 2007 and 8. Uh, I don't need to tell you that. You've seen that. Uh, but if you uh, place your assets in different baskets, you can minimize the, the risk. Again, unlimited investment options. You can invest in real estate, commercial, residential. Uh, you can become a bank. You can uh, invest in trust deeds and so on. Uh, but uh, uh, that's again just very quickly about uh, what we do and uh, 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 next I'm going to bring uh, uh, Tony and Tony is going to uh, share with us, uh, he will be the, the main speaker. Uh, Tony Watson, he actually personally manages clients with over uh, $500 million in real estate uh, holdings. Uh, he had spoken for hundreds of trade organizations throughout the state of California. Uh, he's a hol holding a federal license as an enrolled agent, tax practitioner. Tony can advise, represent, and prepare tax returns for individuals, partnerships, corporations, and any other entity with tax reporting requirements. Aside from his full-time position at Robert Holland Associates, uh, Tony is an active real estate investor. He's an entrepreneur and he enjoys short and long-term trading. With uh, over a decade and a half of experience, Tony, along with his team at Robert Hallen Associates, actively look for newest and most up-to-date strategies to implement on clients' tax filings. They all operate with the same goal in mind, which is to help taxpayers keep more of their wealth and not overspend with the federal and state revenue agencies. So guys, uh, get ready, uh, pull the, the notepad, uh, get a pen, uh, take notes. Uh, if you have questions for Tony, you can chat them in the uh, Q&A uh, session and we will get to your questions at the end. We'll have some time for the Q&A. Um, again, thank, thank you, Tony, for joining us and uh, uh, take it away. I appreciate it, Dimitri. Thank you so much for having me on tonight. Uh, always a pleasure sharing the digital platform with you. Uh, Dimitri and I have known each other for a very long time. Uh, we met through a mutual friend slash client slash webinar, uh, you know, professional nowadays um, it, it, down in Orange County, gosh, over a decade and a half ago. And I realized very quickly as a tax advisor, a professional in my field, uh, that the connection that I would have with Dimitri would be incredibly organic for a number of reasons. Um, a big part of what we do here at Robert Hall & Associates, the tax firm that I've worked for over the past two decades, uh, we, we focus a lot of our time on planning and structuring our clients or, or setting up structures for our clients uh, to help them shelter more of their hard-earned wealth that they've built for themselves, uh, whether it be over a 365-day period, a five-year period, a decade plus. Uh, we want to make sure that we not only help you save tax, but most importantly, that we assist our clients in retaining wealth. Uh, and so tonight's topic, wealth retention through proper year-end tax planning. Uh, once again, my name is Tony Watson. I am here representing uh, the tax firm that I've called home for almost two decades now, uh, Robert Hall & Associates. We are a full-service tax consulting firm. Uh, I myself, my individual client column, like Dimitri had mentioned, uh, my client column personally ranges from you know the real estate professionals to the medical professionals to sometimes even just high-earning W-2 wage earners. I kind of see it all in my column. Uh, and aside from assisting clients with over $500 million in managed real estate and other business dealings, I am also one of actually two keynote speakers here now at Robert Hall & Associates. For about 17 years, I was the only public speaker, but now I, I get to share the digital podium sometimes with uh, a, a wonderful um, colleague of mine. Her name is Nicole, uh, and we collectively speak at over 140 plus events 
on a year to year basis. So I, I very much practice what I preach. I'm not only a tax professional, I talk to people about taxes, but then I also talk to people about real estate and how that works on the tax return. And I also am a, a real estate investor. So I, I, I love what I do. I love coaching people. I love teaching people. And I love absolutely preparing a tax return where we really maximize the bottom line figures, meaning that we maximize any refund or we minimize any liability um, through proper year end planning. There's one phrase that I, I usually wait until the end to give you, but I'm trying to trying to get it out so I don't forget, uh, you know, towards the end of the webinar, failing to plan is ultimately planning to fail. I love that saying. It goes hand in hand with what I do professionally, with what Dimitri does professionally. Uh, so let's make sure that we are setting aside some time prior to the end of the calendar year to put a successful plan in place and not only put it in place, but also implement that plan uh, prior to the end of the calendar year. I by no means am a one-man operation. I work alongside a wonderful senior consulting staff, Nicole Green in that beautiful yellow jacket there. She is the other public speaker for Robert Hall and Associates. So if you're ever on a webinar and I'm not the face on the screen, you're probably being graced by the presence of, of Nicole Green. She's absolutely fantastic. But uh, like I said, I by no means am a one-man operation. We've got about 56 employees at Robert Hall and Associates and we file taxes across the US in all 50 states. Uh, so if you have investments elsewhere in the U.S., we can absolutely assist with those out-of-state filings. Robert Hall & Associates has been around since 1971. We file well over 10,000 tax filings per year. We've got great reviews online. Uh, we've been recognized in some local favorite accounting, uh, or not accounting, but local trade journals and uh, news articles. Same with Sense Financial, who is well-touted in, in, in the professional world of solo 401k and, and self-directed at retirement investing. Um, so you can check us out online at roberthalltaxes.com. Uh, we're kind of a one-stop shop for all of your professional and, and financial needs. We offer tax preparation. We do incorporating for small businesses. We do internal auditing, financial planning, which is a big connector for, for Dimitri and Sense Financial and Robert Hall and Associates. Uh, we offer bookkeeping services. You name it, we've got it. So if you're ever in need of more than just tax preparation services, please feel free to reach out to us. We have vetted out our referrals uh, till the sun comes up. I mean, we we go through an extreme vetting process of any professional vendors that we utilize here at Robert Hall & Associates. So if you're ever looking for a good vendor referral, Dimitri and Sense Financial, they have great, great vendor referrals as well. But if you're looking for somebody on our end, we can always refer you over to that professional. Um, before I hop into the meat and potatoes, I just wanted to mention, I'll, I'll show you the screen at the tail end as well. We do offer free 30-minute consultations. Uh, I suggest that you send over two copies of tax returns. So 2021 and 2022 over to the firm. Let us take a look at it prior to our 30 minute meeting, either in person or via FaceTime or Skype or Zoom, however you want to connect with us. And, and, and so we can review and make sure that if there are any possible audit triggers on the return or things that were missed, we can go ahead and correct those or, or moving forward, we can kind of mold you into the Robert Hall filing client uh, that we have been so successful in assisting over the years. If you're not looking for a new tax advisor and you just want the free education, that's fine as well. You can scan the QR code or text Robert Hall to the number 72,000. We'll add your information to our free periodic tax email update list, and we will let you know about our upcoming free webinars. And all of our education is free at Robert Hall. Just as a, not a forewarning, so to speak, but, but just as a disclaimer, I am not an attorney by no means, whatever I am talking about tonight or discussing with you, it is not for legal advice. I am not pitching any deals to you. I am simply explaining the tax in the income tax side of certain things that will be implemented on your US, US tax filing. Uh, but you know, obviously our attorneys wanna make sure that we're safe. So I do have to make that disclaimer that by no means is any of the information tonight, legal advice or real estate professional advice. This is all from an income tax perspective and the advice that I give as a licensed tax advisor. All right, so as we approach the end of 2023, man, it seems like the past four years have just flown by, haven't they? Uh, and as we approach the tail end of 2023, we're meeting with a lot of clients uh, for year-end planning. Obviously, the wonderful state of California and the federal government got together and extended tax season till November 16th. So technically, you still have two days to file 
2022's tax returns because on October 16th, which was the deadline this year, they met, they announced at about 9.30 or 10 o'clock in the morning that they were going to extend tax season another 30 days. Lucky us, right? Always a great day to be an accountant. By no means am I complaining about any of this. I love what I do. I think it's, once again, always a great day to be a tax accountant. Um, but I, I have been asking my clients, why do you think it, is it? Why do you think it's important to set aside some time prior to the end of the year to map out your situation? And I feel like over the past, you know, 19 and a half years that I've been doing taxes, that there has been one consistent answer above all answers. And that answer, why why is it important to know my tax situation before the end of the year? It's to avoid any unnecessary interest and penalties, right? We want to pay our obligation in tax and not a penny more than that obligated amount. That's it. We just want to pay our tax. We don't want to overpay. We want to retain as much of that wealth as possible, cycle as much into our solo 401ks, our self-directed IRAs, our real estate investments, maybe plug some into a payroll for my child who's on payroll with my business. And that way we are, we are retaining as much of that, that or the, the wealth that we built for ourselves uh, as possible. And this is all by planning ahead. So once again, failing to plan is ultimately planning to fail. We want to put a plan in place so that we have a successful situation before the end of the year and not an unsuccessful position when it comes time for filing 2023's tax return. Probably the second most common answer to this question is positioning. I want to position myself for greater tax benefits. I want to make sure that if I am able to max out a 401k contribution, if I am if I am able to front load a travel cost prior to the end of the year, and I might not be traveling until January or February of next year, maybe I can capture that deduction in this year, save the tax for 2023. Uh, maybe I need to upgrade a work vehicle and take some bonus depreciation on the work vehicle prior to the end of the year. These are all points of positioning power. We need to make sure that we know what your year-to-date income, your year-to-date expenses are prior to the end of the year so we know what we're up against, right? I like surprises when it comes to surprise birthday parties. My birthday was on Sunday, and today I come into the office and my staff brings in a cake into my office and starts singing happy birthday. That was a very sweet surprise for me. But when it comes time to file my tax returns, I do not want surprises. I want to position myself for the greatest tax benefits and maximize the money in my own pocket, my own investments, my own accounts without overpaying Uncle Sam and the state of California or whatever state I am filing in. The third answer that I get, and probably the one that hits home most with me, peace of mind, knowing what the results are before the tax appointment. I want to make sure that I understand what the bottom line is on my tax return, do I owe? Am I getting money back? Am I breaking even? And that way, when the clock strikes midnight, 12.01 a.m. on January 1st, I'm celebrating the new year with my loved ones, with my friends, and I'm not thinking about my tax liability that I don't know is owed or my refund that I might think I'm getting but end up not getting when I file my return. I want to know and have peace of mind what those results are going to be before I even file my tax return. And that is the power behind year-end planning. We can give you peace of mind. We can position you for, for great success when it comes to filing your tax returns and make sure that we, at the end of the day, are helping you retain the wealth that you've built for yourself and not overspending that wealth with Uncle Sam and the wonderful state of California. Um, sometimes my clients will have this question for me. Most of the time I explain it pretty in detail during the appointment as to why I'm printing out a tax return with four quarterly payments. And I always explain it to my clients in the same way. I've never, I've never veered off from the same explanation. Their question is, do I have to take, make estimated tax payments? Or as I'm holding, you know, those four vouchers in front of the clients, I say, here are your quarterly payments. This is based on the liability that you had in the previous year, so for 2022, and the federal government is suggesting for you to prepay 110% of the previous year's liability or 90% of the current year liability, whichever is less. And here are the vouchers to do that. Here are the vouchers to hit the 110% uh, threshold. The 90%, you would just either skip the fourth quarter payment or you'd come back in for an appointment and we dial in the 90% calculation. But once again, this is potentially to avoid unnecessary penalties and interest. And that's why I put it depends on the screen, because some of you might have had a banner year 
where your income increased or even doubled in 2023 versus 2022. Some of my real estate clients have seen half the revenue in 2023 that they saw in 2022. So, and then some have just been even keeled, right? Year over year, it's been roughly the same. So it really all depends on where you are lending on that spectrum. Are you seeing an increase in revenue, a decrease in revenue, or are you kind of plateauing 2022 to 2023? For the individuals who have increased income, we need to make sure that you are following either the 110% calculation or 90% of the current year liability calculation. If you're even keeled, all you really have to do is pay the same liability as last year just to make sure that you're not getting, you know, getting hit with unnecessary penalties and interest. If your income goes down in 2023 versus 2022, why would you ever have to pay 110% of the previous year liability, which could be substantially overpaying Uncle Sam in the state of California, if your income actually went down this year and not up or plateaued? So we need to recalculate and make that 90% calculation of estimated liability and keep more money in your pocket so that you don't overpay the government and have to wait two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight months to get that refund back. I'd much rather keep that money in your pocket. So do you have to make estimated tax payments? It really all depends. And everybody's individual scenario, all of you joining in tonight, your individual scenario is different and unique to every other person that is sitting digitally right next to you this evening. So just make sure that you map out a plan for you specifically and don't copy and paste from your neighbors, your coworkers, your family members, your friends, tax returns. Some of the strategies that they implement not might, might not work for you. Some of the strategies, tra strategies that you implement might not work for your coworkers or fam family members. So just make sure that you map out and custom tailor a plan for you specifically. Now, when you come in for these year-end meetings, we call them in the tax industry, we call them W review meetings or year-end review meetings. And essentially what we like to do is sit down and look at your year-to-date income and your year-to-date expenses and figure out what that projected bottom line profit looks like prior to the end of the year. And that gives us, once again, that puts us in a very powerful position because it shows us what your net revenue looks like compared to your net revenue the previous year. Right. So if you've seen that increase in revenue, then you need to make sure that you're hitting that 110 percent of the prior year liability calculation. If your income went down, you want to make sure you hit that 90 percent of the current year liability calculation. You have to cover one of the two of those years, whichever. And I, I'm sorry, it says whichever is greater. It's actually whichever is less, not whichever is greater. I mistyped on that. I apologize. Uh, but it's whichever is less. Now, if you are an employee versus a self-employed individual, the calculation is different because as a W-2 employee, you have taxes taken out of your paychecks every single month. So in this year-end meeting, we want to make sure that we see the most recent pay stub to figure out, okay, what have you been paid year to date so far in taxable income? And what have you withheld as far as federal and state income tax is concerned to cover this, this individual taxable income for 2023? If you're self-employed, you don't have W-2 paychecks. Most of the time you don't, unless you've been put on payroll under your own corporation. But most of the time, a self-employed individual will not have payroll quarter one, quarter two, and quarter three. And they're coming in to do year-end planning in quarter four to run a payroll for themselves. And so we won't have that calculation of withholding out of paychecks or anything. But what we will need to calculate is the gross revenue year to date, your gross expenses year to date, figuring out that net profit and make sure that we run what's called the reasonable salary payout for you as a, an individual self-employed business owner. That's if you're an S corporation or even a partnership. But if you're a sole proprietor, a non-incorporated self-employed individual, somebody who doesn't file as an incorporated entity, there is no payroll involved in that but we still need to calculate what your projected net revenue is so that we can send you out of that meeting to go and fund your 401ks, to go and fund your SEP IRAs, to go and purchase the new vehicles, upgrade computer equipment, reinvest the money back into one of your rental properties to help reduce taxable cash flow. Whatever it may be, we send you back out into the wild to reinvest profit back into infrastructure. And guess what? In turn, when the government sees you reinvesting profit back into infrastructure, it saves you an exponential amount of tax and in turn also helps you retain wealth for yourself. So just be aware of that. Now let's talk about quickly some top tax deductions. I don't want to spend too much time on the top tax deductions here, but I think it's really important as we approach year end that you know what 
each of these deductions really means for you personally on your individual returns, whether you're a self-employed business owner or a rental property owner, because both are businesses. Number one deduction across the board for business owners, for real estate investors, is going to be marketing and advertising. Marketing and advertising is a dollar for dollar tax write-off that will help you reduce your taxable income dollar for dollar. Now, what does dollar for dollar mean? That means that if I have $50,000 in income, self-employed income, and I spend $20,000 in marketing and advertising, I only report taxable income of $30,000 because I made 50 grand, I spent 20 grand on marketing and advertising, except I get to dollar for dollar deduct it or dollar for dollar reduce my income, which means that I'm reporting $30,000 in taxable net profit. And then you get to subtract all of your other expenses. But that's what I mean by dollar for dollar reducing your taxable income or your gross income. Marketing and advertising, a great way to reinvest back into infrastructure while marketing and branding and promoting your business and allowing yourself to expand operations and at the same time in turn pay less income tax which is crazy. I mean, that, that, that's the best thing about learning the internal revenue code is being able to make money and spend money in ways that will allow you to pay less tax on whatever your leftover bottom line profit is. All right. One quick note during the pandemic years, the more client, I, I saw more clients investing their money in 2020, 2021, 2022, even 2023. I saw more clients investing their money in marketing and advertising, branding and promoting swag, all of that stuff. Uh, and, and the one correlation or one very common common factor in those tax returns where I saw marketing and advertising costs increase, I also saw that those were the returns that made more income in those calendar years. The people who spent less on marketing and advertising, their income was either plateauing or it was falling off a cliff during the pandemic years. And the people who spent a lot of time during the pandemic years marketing and advertising their business, they're coming out of the flames or the smoke, so to speak, of the pandemic as, as the phoenix that has risen from the ashes. I mean, there, there is no stopping a lot of these businesses because they did the groundwork they invested back into infrastructure or reinvested back into infrastructure and did it the right way. Marketing and advertising, great dollar for dollar deduction. For rental property owners, if you have a vacancy in your rental property, guess what? You got to market your vacancy. You got to promote it. Otherwise, you know, we're, we're, we'd all be so lucky to just have friends marketing for us saying, hey, you have a vacancy? Yeah, I have a vacancy. And then all of a sudden they reach out to 50 of their closest friends who are looking for properties, right? It doesn't work like that in most cases. It might work for you that way, but it doesn't work for the general public that way. So you have to market and promote that vacancy. So keep that in mind. Great dollar for dollar write-off. Number two, professional supplies and equipment. Well, this picture somewhat looks like an in-home office, right? This might not be the corporate office that people were wor used to working from uh, prior to the pandemic. Now, these are the in-home office deductions that people are taking. Professional supplies and equipment, I love this deduction for a number of reasons. Number one, um, you have options of how to write these expenses off. Let's say you need a brand new laptop. You go and you spend three or four grand on that new laptop. I know MacBooks can cost all the way up to seven, eight grand. They're just ridiculously expensive. But, you know, the super powerful ones to work from home and then to travel with, sometimes they cost two, three, four plus grand. And let's say that you need that new updated computer, but you've already spent enough money to wipe out your net profit. Let's say that you're already showing a net zero profit through your business and you're thinking, well, I don't need the deduction now, so I might as well wait until next year to purchase it. But then you're saying, well, I need the computer now. I actually need the new computer now because my other computer is on the fritz. It's a sm smoke's coming out of the side of it, whatever's happening to it. And so you go out and you purchase that, that computer. Even though you've already wiped out all of your profit, that's okay. You're, you don't have any tax liability on that revenue. The federal government gives you an option to either write this expense off all in one year or spread it out over the lifespan of the asset. A piece of equipment, for instance, has a seven-year lifespan. A piece of furniture, uh, you know, a, a desk, a chair, a filing cabinet, a shelving unit, storage unit uh, has a five year lifespan. So even though you don't need the write off this year, you may actually still need to incur the expense. Except now, if you don't need the write off, you can take that $3,000 computer, spread it out over seven years. And let's say that next year you need the remaining portion of the write off, you can accelerate the remaining six years of depreciation because you already took one year in the first year that you acquired it, you can accelerate the remaining six years of depreciation 
all in year two when you actually need the write-off. So number one, I love the options that we have with this particular write-off. Number two, it has one of the lowest risks for audit out of any deduction that you take. I mean, think about this. Professionally speaking, in your world, who do you know that can do what they do professionally without a laptop, without a cell phone? without a desk, a chair, a filing cabinet. So the federal government knows this, especially coming out of the pandemic. They know that more people are working from home than ever before in the history of the Internal Revenue Code. Yes, in-home office deductions tend to have a higher risk for audit, but I think that we will, statistically speaking, we will start to see a change in the amount of audits on in-home offices. I, I'm just foreseeing that, and we haven't seen one in a very long time anyway, so I think that kind of the writing was on the wall even prior to the pandemic but great overall dollar for dollar deductions against business income. And if you don't need the write-off, you can spread it out over the lifespan of the asset. Number three, car and truck costs. If you're not taking the mileage deduction, you're taking actual auto costs. So the tire replacements and the oil changes, so on and so forth. If you're taking the actual auto costs, you're not taking the mileage deduction. So you can only take one or the other. Now, during the pandemic, we saw a lot of people purchasing new vehicles. In fact, we saw a lot of people purchasing heavyweight vehicles because of something called bonus depreciation. Now, let's take a trip back in time really quick to 2022. Let's say that my business or my, my individual car that I use for business was on the fritz, right? The engine was smoking, uh, you know, I, the, the, the axle was crooked, so I was always getting flat tires and I was done with it. I need it. I need a new car. I go to talk to my tax advisor. I say, hey, listen, my company needs to buy me a new vehicle. How do I acquire it? How do I title it? How do I insure it? And is there a difference between me buying a large vehicle or a smaller vehicle? So your tax advisor sitting there in front of you in 2022. So once again, we'll get to 2023 in a second. But last year, I was suggesting to my clients who were actively looking for new vehicles. Once again, I'm not the preparer that's going to send you out to buy a vehicle simply for the tax write-off. You already have to actively be wanting or looking for a new vehicle for this to work. And so let's say that you come to me and you say, hey, I need a new vehicle. And I say, well, what kind of vehicle do you really need for your work? Well, I need a work truck. I need a Chevy uh, or GMC Sierra or a Chevy Silverado. Uh, okay, great. That vehicle weighs over 6,000 pounds. And during the 2022 tax year, if you bought a vehicle for business use that weighed over 6,000 pounds, it qualified for 100% bonus depreciation, which meant that that vehicle's purchase price was 100% tax deductible. Now, it had to be titled under your business. It had to be insured under your business. It had to be paid for under your business. It did not have to be bought outright cash. You could still finance the vehicle and take it 100% as a write-off as long as it was acquired and titled correctly under a business. And number two, as long as it weighed over 6,000 pounds. Okay, so that worked with Chevy Tahoes, that worked with Silverados, GMC Sierras, it worked with the G-Wagons, the Range Rovers, the Tesla Model Xs, even the Chrysler minivans weigh over 6,000 pounds. So there were a lot of vehicles that qualified for that bonus depreciation write-off. Fast forward to 2023, January 1st, 2023, the Inflation Reduction Act passes. The Inflation Reduction Act is starting to phase out the bonus depreciation benefit. So now starting January 1st of 2023, you are no longer allowed this write-off at 100%, but you still get a great write-off for it. 80% is now the deductible amount. So that $100,000 Range Rover or $100,000 Tesla Model X is acquired under your business title insured correctly. And instead of getting $100,000 write-off, you're still getting $80,000 of it as a dollar-for-dollar -dollar deduction against federal taxable income. Now, I hate to say this because we all love the state that we live in for the most part, right? But California does not conform to this part of the Internal Revenue Code. So even though the federal government will allow you an 80% deduction on this bonus depreciation write-off, California will not. OK, so you have to understand that that this is going to be a great federal tax deduction, but we need to sit down and calculate what the adjustments are on the state side to make sure that, hey, it might have wiped out eighty thousand dollars or all the way down to zero profit on the federal side. But you're still going to have liability on the state side because it doesn't calculate at an 80 percent or eighty thousand dollar write off. Now, that's for heavyweight vehicles. If the vehicle weighs under six thousand pounds, it's not that you don't get a write off. You just get a much smaller upfront deduction. The first year bonus depreciation is still at 80%, but it's 80% of, a, I believe, $20,200 now. Uh, we're still waiting on the final code around depreciation for 2022, but I believe it's going to be $20,200, and that's a much lower write-off. Now, the remaining portion of the vehicle, so of this, of this 
vehicle that weighs under 6,000 pounds, the remaining value of it gets deducted over the next five years because that's the lifespan of the asset. So it's not that you lose all of the rest of the write-off. You just get a bonus depreciation write-off in the first year of 80% of $20,200. And then the remaining value of the vehicle depreciates and is deducted over the next five years. Sit down with your tax advisor. Make sure that you map out a plan. Do not go out and purchase a vehicle simply for the tax write-off. You have to actively be looking for a property, uh, for not a property, for a, for a car in order for this to work. I'd much rather you buy real estate. I'll, I'll be fully transparent about that. I would much rather you buy real estate than buy vehicles, but if you absolutely need a new vehicle, definitely go out and acquire it and title it in correct ways to, to receive that major tax benefit. Um, number four, legal and professional fees, dollar for dollar tax deductible to offset rental income, self-employed income, great ways to further reduce taxable revenue. Uh, that's gonna be number four. Last but not least, number five, Bonus depreciation, not like the bonus depreciation that we just discussed for the cars, but bonus depreciation on real estate investments. More so than ever during the pandemic, I saw more people educating themselves on real estate investing. And when you type in real estate investing and tax deductions, more likely than not in the first five to 10 links that pop up, you're going to see a link regarding bonus depreciation and cost segregation. Cost segregation has been around for quite some time, and this is the ability or an election that is made on your individual return when you own rental real estate investment property, where cost seg gives you the ability to reach forward into future years and accelerate future year deduction to take it all in this year as a write-off, meaning that instead of waiting 27.5 years for a residential property depreciation write-off, you can file a cost seg election and accelerate future year depreciation to take it all in this year. I have seen clients exercise cost seg where they were able to accelerate two, three, four, five, six hundred plus thousand dollars of future year depreciation all in this calendar year. I saw it a lot in 2020. I saw it even more so in 2021. I saw it even more so in 2022. And everybody who did cost seg in 2021, 2022, most likely they did it again in 2023 because they are wanting to capture the deduction now, save the money now. And with all of that tax reduction and tax savings and wealth retention, they are able to catapult into another real estate investment and they just copy and paste. With the new acquisition, they receive cost segregation benefits. They file the accounting method change election, so on and so forth. And they get this massive write-off to help further reduce taxable income. This will not be for all of you, okay? It makes sense in certain instances, but we have to sit down and map out a plan around cost segregation. Once again, this is the ability to receive a benefit from future years all in this calendar year. If you're planning on purchasing a property, doing cost seg, and then selling the property two years from now, doesn't make sense. Because for those of you who are veteran real estate investors in the room, you know that if you do not do a 1031 exchange and you just outright sell the property, all of that depreciation benefit is going to be, have to be recaptured and you have to pay tax on it. So there really is only a benefit in that one year and then two years down the road, you got to pay all of that benefit back. Okay. This is great if you are the type of person like myself who buys a real estate investment property and never sells it. And if I do sell it, I sell it into a 1031 exchange and acquire more real estate. I do up leg exchanges, even keeled exchanges, maybe even sometimes a down leg exchange from time to time, tapping into some equity, paying a little bit of tax on it, but paying off my primary residence debt, or maybe even wanting to pay off some student loan debt. Whatever your debt is looming in the background, you can very much sell a rental property control the amount of capital gain or what's called boot that comes out of the 1031 exchange, pay the tax on that small amount, and then cycle the remaining amount back into another investment. You can do one door for 15 doors. You can do 20 doors for one door. You can do five doors for 10 doors. It doesn't matter how you mix and match uh, the 1031 exchange. 1031 exchanges allow you to kick the depreciation can down the road and never pay tax on it and, and you're, the goal here is to, to never pay tax on it until you kick the can, right? So you're kicking the tax can down the road until you kick the can, and then your beneficiaries inherit your property with a stepped up basis, meaning that your children 
if they inherit your property and aren't currently on title of those investments while you're still alive, if they inherit those properties in death, they get to refresh, hit the full refresh button on all of the depreciation deduction that you've taken in previous years. So they they avoid the tax completely up to whatever the, the, estate exam, the estate tax exemption is as of the date of your passing, which currently is about, what, $25.2 million for a married couple, uh, $12.6 million if you're single. Uh, so it's a massive, massive legacy benefit for your next of kin. Bonus depreciation, cost segregation. If you want to learn more about this, please feel free to sign up for a free consultation with Robert Hall and Associates. Let's talk quickly about the deductibility of mortgage interest. I know that there's a lot of confusion around this, especially since 2018 when they put in the $10,000 state and local tax cap uh, for individuals. This has nothing to do with the SALT limitation, meaning that that $10,000 state and local tax cap where it caps your property taxes, your state income tax that you paid throughout the year at $10,000, this has nothing to do with that. Mortgage interest and the deductibility of mortgage interest is completely separate from state and local taxes. Okay. On a primary residence, currently you are only allowed the interest expense deduction on the first $750,000 of mortgage debt servicing on the property. Okay. Uh, that is if you purchased, a, purchased the home after December 15th of 2017. If you purchased that home prior to December 15th of 2017, you are grandfathered into the old part of the Internal Revenue Code, which allows you the interest write off on the first $1 million of debt. Okay. But if you purchased your primary residence after December 15th of 2017, you are only allowed the interest expense deduction on the first $750,000 of debt servicing. California never conformed to this part of the code. So California still allows you to take the interest on the first $1 million of debt. Federal government only allows you the interest deduction on the first 750. So you have to also work with a tax advisor that understands the differences between the federal code and the state code. Okay. Now this is $750,000 of debt servicing on a primary residence and $750,000 of debt servicing on a second personal residence, not a rental property because rental properties are separate. There is no limit. Once you convert a property or purchase a property and turn it into a business, a rental property, there is no limit to the mortgage interest write-off. You have a three, four, $5 million loan on that rental property. Guess what? Your interest is dollar for dollar tax deductible, 100% of it, okay? That's the major difference between a primary residence and a second personal residence. Once again, not a rental property. So that's, that's included in the primary limitations. But as soon as you convert that second home or your primary residence into a rental property, you no longer have any limits on mortgage interest or on property taxes. So we saw during the pandemic, a lot of people turning their second homes into rental properties, Airbnbs, VRBOs, uh, corporate housing. Uh, I just talked to a client earlier today who had uh, some of his rental uh, portfolio turn into short-term housing for traveling nurses that come back and forth from other states to California. So there are a number of ways that you can mix and match some of these real estate investments. And this works also great if these properties are in your retirement accounts, right? Because then all of a sudden, you're not really looking for the deductions because the benefit in the retirement account is that all of your cash flow is tax deferred. Uh, well, and, and it's not even taxable if it's in a Roth 401k. Uh, so, you know, there are ways, once again, to mix and match some of your investments and really, really maximize the, the wealth management and the, uh, the, the financial planning side of real estate investing with retirement plans, so on and so forth. Which leads me to retirement versus self-directed retirement investing, right? The whole reason why Dimitri and I really connect, I mean, we're friends because we've known each other for a very long time, but I think on an intellectual level, the reason why we connect so well is because we understand the power behind self-directed retirement investing versus just normal, traditional retirement investing, right? For, for the longest time, and Dimitri, I, I might have this date wrong, but I think self-directed IRAs and, and self-directed retirement plans, this the, the ability to do this has been around since the early 70s, I believe. I think it was like 1973 or 1974, but the ability to, instead of being forced to invest your money in the stock market and basically legally gamble your money away in the stock market, what it seems nowadays, right? Um, you know, and I'm not saying all, all investing is bad in the stock market, but really you have no control over any of that. Like Dimitri had mentioned in, in his intro, you have no control over what the stock market's going to do. 
a president tweets about something and the stock market is impacted, right? That That's how fragile the stock markets are. But the diversified investing into stocks, into real estate, into businesses, into cryptocurrency, this allows you to not have all of your eggs essentially in one basket. That cartoon, I've seen that cartoon before. I think it's just a wonderful cartoon. It should be posted on every cartoon page from here to, to the East Coast in newspaper newspapers, articles in the cartoon section. But you know, it goes it goes so well with the topic at hand. You don't want to be heavily invested in one asset, right? I do suggest for you to diversify, especially if you know and believe in the power behind real estate investing under diversified retirement portfolios and, and, and accounts such as self-directed IRAs and solo 401ks. So make sure that you're having this conversation with Dimitri, make sure that you're having this conversation with your tax advisor and maximizing these positions. And let's say you're coming out of another job. Let's say that you've just exited into retirement from a previous employer and now you've got this 401k or this IRA sitting there. Let's let's figure out a way to diversify that retirement portfolio into things that have a much more consistent dividend paying lifespan, right? Because whether the economy is good or bad, guess what? People will always need a place to live. I am very, very pro real estate. I understand the interest rates are through the roof right now. But listen, we've seen this before. I mean, I, I, did, I was talking to my father the other day on the phone and I was telling him, hey, yeah, I'm talking to all these real estate professionals and they're, they're saying that the market's slow because they're seven and a half to eight percent interest rates. And he goes, oh, my goodness. Well, when you know, when I was back in my day, I saw interest rates of 14, 15 percent. And I've heard that before. And but, you know, having that refresher of conversation with my father the other night, uh, it really made made sense to me that, hey, we've seen this before and we'll probably see it again in in maybe maybe not in my lifetime, but maybe in my kids lifetimes where the stock market and the real estate market, everything ebbs and flows. Right. I don't know if we'll ever see 2.49 percent interest rates again. I hope we do, because I'll be buying up and gobbling up real estate as much as possible. I don't foresee that happening. But we have seen this kind of ebb and flow before. Uh, people are just living a little in fear right now. But I'd say that it's never been a, a bad time to buy real estate. Shoot, when the interest rates do drop, guess what? If you go to the market to buy real estate, you're going to have a lot more competition. When all of those property rates drop through the through the floor and they drop back down to 5%, 5 5.5%, if it drops that far, you are going to be in a line of hundreds and hundreds of thousands, if not millions of property purchasers, and there's going to be a lot more competition. So if you can lock in a home purchase now at a 75 to 8% interest rate, sure, it's a little bit higher, right? But in six to eight months, maybe even 12 months, you'll be able to refinance that loan, drop it out of that 75 8% interest rate, Hopefully, right? I'm not I'm not the guru of real estate here, but I do have to kind of lean on the professionals that I speak to as well, the lenders that I speak to here in Los Angeles and elsewhere in the US uh, to help us, you know, figure out what the future has in store for us. So once again, whether the economy is good or bad, people will always need a place to live. I've always believed that. I've practiced it. I've preached it. Uh, it's just an incredible uh, and very powerful motto to live by, especially if you ever want to grow significant wealth in real estate investing. Um Last but not least, I want to talk quickly about the importance of basis because I have a lot of clients investing in syndicated investments, whether it be ATM businesses, vending machine businesses, real estate syndications. One thing that you want to make sure of is that you understand the importance of basis. What does this mean? Basis means you have skin in the game. You actually have equity in the business, meaning that when you purchase a property, let's say I, I go out and I, I put a bid down on a million dollar property. I come in with a $350,000 deposit or down payment, right? Right out the gate, I have $350,000 in basis in the property. And let's say I go out and I find a recourse debt to acquire the seven, you know, $650,000 difference. I acquire a recourse debt on that property and I acquire this million dollar property. Well, if I acquire a property, I put $350,000 down, I get a $650,000 recourse debt loan. My basis in that property is a million dollars because recourse debt is added on to my capital infusion. And now I am fully vested in that property. That means that if this property turns around and shows a loss in its first year after mortgage interest, property taxes, improvements, uh, depreciation, let's say it shows a loss of a hundred grand that as a real estate professional, if I'm a real estate professional, 
I would be allowed a $100,000 write-off against that, against other income that I have on my individual return because I have enough basis to cover that loss. Let me explain a scenario where it doesn't work that way. Let's say I invest $50,000 into an ATM syndication and the ATM syndication bonuses out the depreciation of all of the machines. And they're, they're telling me, hey, give us 50 grand, you'll get 150 grand right off on the back end. It'll be all good. And I get this investment packet back at the end of the year. I bring it to my tax advisor and it shows that I invested $50,000, but the investment itself never acquired any debt. But it showed $150,000 loss allocated to me individually as, as promised. Well, my basis in this, in this investment is only $50,000. If there is no non-recourse debt, qualified non-recourse debt, if there's no recourse debt, the only basis I have in that investment is 50 grand. So the only amount of the $150,000 loss that I can take is $50,000. The $100,000 difference has to be carried forward as an unallowed passive loss carry forward into 2024 because I do not have enough basis in the business to cover that full loss. This is incredibly important to understand because it is not the wild west where you bring this massive K1 loss from a real estate syndication or an ATM syndication or a vending machine syndication to your tax advisor and just say, hey, deduct this fully against my taxable income and save me all this money. You have to make sure that there is enough recourse and or qualified non-recourse debt that adds to your basis and allows you to take that deduction. Non-recourse debt is not added to your basis. So in this case, if it is like a primary residence that has non-recourse debt, obviously you're not going to take losses on, on a primary residence. But if there is other non-recourse debt, meaning that you are not personally held responsible for paying back this debt, maybe the partnership that you're investing in, they are held responsible for paying back that debt, then you cannot take that loss or add that to your basis. You have to work with tax advisors who understand the calculation of basis and in investments because this is a hot target for the internal revenue service these days. If any of this is ringing a bell, you got to make sure you reach out to Robert Hall and Associates and discuss the importance of basis with a tax advisor, with a licensed tax advisor, because this could be the saving grace for you saving hundreds of thousands of dollars in tax or investing money and not getting any tax benefit. That that's seriously could be the difference between this conversation that you are not having or having with your tax advisor. It is truly the difference between being able to deduct the loss and not being able to deduct the loss, okay? Hopefully that didn't confuse too many people, but I wanted to end on that note. Uh, uh, three senior preparer highlights this this week, uh, Mariana Torres, Jackie Fu, and Candace Kane. Uh, these are three of our senior consultants that still have plenty of openings for year-end planning. Please feel free to reach out to us with any questions. Uh, or, or you know, any any scenarios that you want to run, run by us. Best way to sign up for the free consultation is to text Robert Hall to the number seventy two thousand, or you can scan scan the QR code. It'll automatically prompt you to click a button and sign up for the free consultation. Bring the most difficult questions to us, please. We challenge you with the with the difficult questions. But hopefully, I hit a couple really unique points tonight that might have turned on some light bulbs and sparked a conversation that you could have with one of our senior tax advisors. But Dimitri, I am open to uh, to Q and A now. If we've got some time for some questions here, and thank you so much for for joining, I really appreciate you having me back, Dimitri. Uh, thank you so much, Tony. A lot of great information, guys. If you do have uh, questions for Tony, now is the time to type them in the Q and A session, and uh, I will ask those. Uh, so, uh, just also uh, uh, bear in mind that uh, when you are uh, asking a question, other people can learn from it. So don't hesitate, type your question and uh, you learn from it, other people will learn from it as well. Uh, Tony, let's start up by uh, talking about uh, um, the depreciation on uh, rental property. If you buy a new property, uh, how much can you depreciate and how, what are the results, uh, tax benefits from that? Yeah. So if you purchase a brand new property and, and it doesn't have to be like newly built, it just has to be new to you. Uh, you have to determine what the building value is versus the land value and whatever the building value is. Normally it's like a 60 or 65 percent split. So 60 to 65 percent building, 35 to 40 percent land. That's probably the most common split. Um, 
and you take the building value itself. Let me give you an example. Let's say you buy a million dollar property and let's say 60% is building, 40% is land. So the building value is 600,000. Without cost segregation, you take that $600,000 property, you divide it by or the building, $600,000 building, you divide it by 27.5 years and your depreciation write off each year over 27 and a half years is going to be $21,818. Now, if you on this, because remember, cost seg does not work on your primary residence or a second personal residence. It only works on rental investments. It has to be a business property. So let's say that this million dollar property is a business. It's a rental property. You potentially, and I, I'm not a cost seg specialist. We use GTG Consulting, Jeffrey Gann with GTG Consulting to run the cost seg analysis. But let's say that you run that analysis and on $600,000 of building value, Jeffrey Gann through his cost segregation analysis, this third party analysis, let's say they're able to accelerate $350,000 of that depreciation to capture it all in one year. Well, that would be your first year depreciation write off. And then whatever was remaining would be depreciated over the remaining 27 and a half years of the building or 27 and a half years of the depreciation lifespan. So it really all depends. If you don't do cost seg, 21,800 and change essentially is your yearly depreciation write off. If you elect cost segregation in the first year, that's a lot easier. It works best with, with properties that were purchased in either this year or maybe a property that's only one year old. Um, the best thing to do is if you purchased a property in 2023 to elect cost seg for 2023, that way you don't have to make an election to change your accounting method. If you bought the home in 2021, let's say, and now you're just learning about cost seg, you can still do cost segregation on the property, but your accountants have to file a form with the government called a form 3115, which is a change of accounting method stating that, hey, we are no longer depreciating the property over 27 and a half years. We're going to accelerate 15 to 20 years of that property all in one year and anything remaining we're going to depreciate over 27 and a half years. So it works best with brand new properties, either one, either brand new in 2023 or a year old. Um, hopefully that answered the question. Uh, thank you, Tony, for a uh, uh, detailed answer. Uh, mm -hmm. Guys, again, I do have uh, two more questions here. Uh, if you uh, can think of anything, go ahead and type uh, that in the Q&A. Uh, next question. You mentioned hiring a child in your business. Can you expand on this? Uh, I own a small business. How can I do it? And what are the benefits? Absolutely. So what we see a lot of people doing nowadays is setting up family partnerships. Um, and, and that way you don't necessarily have to put your kids on payroll. Uh, you know, as far as social security and Medicare taxes concerned, you can literally pay them up to their standard deduction, which I believe is $12,950. That standard deduction might be changing for 2023, but as of 2022, it was still $12,950 and you can pay your children for, you know, shredding paper or cleaning your office, you know, sweeping the floors doing things that they're capable of doing. Obviously, if your baby is six months old, you know, you'd have to get a little bit creative with that. Maybe you want to take professional photos of them and they can be the face that puts, you know, that you put on your business card to show your clients that you're a family person, right? That you're a family man or woman and, and you're promoting your business that way. Um, so you might have to get creative with the younger individuals, but, you know, I think it works best with children who are of age to at least be able to sweep the floors and shred papers, so on and so forth. But you can technically pay them up to their standard deduction of $12,950 and write them off dollar for dollar without having to fund any money into Social Security and Medicare. Now, what I've seen a lot of my clients do under their S corporations as their children get older, they start paying their children higher salaries so that they can max out deferred retirement plans for their children. And that way, when they enter into college, they show qualified income might might even be able to qualify for some financial aid based on their household income. But most importantly, when they graduate from college, they will already have established tax return credit so that they can apply for their own home loans, business lines of credit. It gives them a leg up on their competition. Um, and this was stuff that that, you know, my father as a businessman, as a real estate investor, he had taught me and talked me through as I was turning age 15, 16 years old. Uh, he wanted me to learn the family business and start helping with, you know, property management and things like that. And so I saw my parents doing all of this when I was young. Uh, you know, and I always saw the papers, the tax paperwork spread out over the dining room table. And, you know, I, I probably realized not at that time, I probably realized years later, maybe when I was in my, you know, early 20s, 
how important that was for me as a business investor and as, as a, a tax professional, seeing all of that and hearing the language and the verbiage, that was incredibly important. And I was never put on salary with my, with my father's business, but nowadays you see that as a very common tax shelter. Um, so in some cases, you don't have to actually run a formal payroll. In other circumstances, you might, but it's a very straightforward process, definitely a conversation that you would need to have with your tax advisor to map out how to make that all work, though. Um, if I just said, yes, put, put all of your children on payroll for $12,950, that wouldn't be fair to all of you because everyone's tax return and tax scenario is different. But it is possible. I guess that's what I'm saying. It is possible to pay your children and deduct them and to use them as the tax shelters they were meant to be. Just kidding. We, we love our kids no matter whether they're tax shelters or not. But, you know, let's take advantage of that as long as we can, as long as they're under our roofs. Right. Great, great question uh, and great answer. Um, another one, uh, is the 20% QBI still applicable today? Absolutely. So QBI is going to, I believe, I, I don't, don't, don't quote me on this. I believe that it's supposed to sunset either in 2027 or 2032. I'm not 100% positive on that. I'll have to do my due diligence on that end, but QBI is still available for 2023. And that is essentially a benefit that you have to qualify for. Um, the qualifying factor for a married filing joint is upwards of, I think, like $531,000 of taxable income. And as long as your joint taxable income is below that, 20% of your cash flow from your real estate investments and or 20% of your K-1 profit from your businesses pays nothing in federal income tax. But there is a phase in and phase out threshold. Um, I actually, in previous years, when I was doing presentations, I had a whole slide presentation on the qualified business income deduction. This has been around since 2018. It is by far one of the greatest benefits that the Internal Revenue Code has ever offered. But you have to qualify for this benefit, meaning that your taxable income has to be low enough or below a certain threshold to qualify for that 20% tax-free benefit. California never conformed to that part of the Internal Revenue Code, by the way. This is just a federal benefit, but that essentially, let me give you an example. Let's say that my wife and I are both self-employed. I'm a real estate professional. My wife is a real estate professional. We both make 150 grand taxable income. You add that together, it's now at 300 grand in taxable income, well below the $531,000 threshold. We go to file our tax return. We qualify for QBI because we meet all the qualifications. And in turn, that makes $60,000, not 6,000, $60,000 of our $300,000 of self-employed profit tax-free on the federal side. As you can imagine in the, let's say 22% BRAC, 22% bracket on $60,000, that benefit alone saved us about $13,200 in federal income tax by not doing really anything. Well, actually I take that back by planning before year end to make sure that we are strategizing, maxing out deferred comp to drop you low enough to qualify for the 20% QBI benefit. So it's all about, once again, it's all about qualifying for that benefit. Not everyone will qualify, especially the high income earners, but you have to plan ahead to strategize and implement ways to drop yourself below that qualifying threshold. Thanks, Tony. Uh, another question. If I purchase the property as my primary, but then started renting that out, can I still do a cost segregation on it? The, the, yeah, you can. Um, you know, once again, if you if you moved out of the property, you'd have to establish the property as a rental investment. Um, you know, the, it probably isn't going to be a major benefit for you. It really all depends on a couple of key factors as to how long you have owned the property for. Uh, but if uh, you know, for, I'll give you a perfect example. I had a client who had lived in a property for a very long time, and during the pandemic, he retired and he put about $350,000 of improvements into his property, mainly to build an ADU on the backside of his property, right? So in this particular instance, like if you just live in the front home and the home has never been improved and you lived in it for 20 plus, 30 plus years, yeah, cost seg is probably not going to be an option for you because the home really doesn't have any structural improvements that warrant a benefit of bonus depreciation. But if you build on an ADU in the backside of your house, where if you add square footage, that's a different story. Uh, that addition or that major improvement could actually qualify for bonus depreciation benefit through cost seg. 
uh, if you are turning around and renting out that portion of your property. But once again, if you've lived in a home for 20, 30 plus years, and now you're turning it into a rental property, cost seg would probably not work for you. Um, I'd have to run that scenario by Jeffrey Gann, but from what I recall in previous conversations, it doesn't work that way. You would have to have major structural or square footage improvements to that property in order for it to make sense now as a rental property, now that you moved out and now you're renting it out in order for that cost seg benefit to make sense. Thank you. Uh, we got a couple more here. Uh, can you please speak to foreign uh, investments? Can I buy land in Mexico with my rollover IRA? Buying land in Mexico with your IRA? I, maybe, Dimitri, that would be a better question for you. I'm not, I'm not sure. Uh, on that one. You, you absolutely can. Uh, yeah, you can. Uh, uh, as I explained at the beginning, the only investment that you're not allowed to make with your uh, IRA will be collectibles and uh, life insurance uh, contracts. So you absolutely can buy real estate anywhere in the world with uh, your retirement account. And we have clients who done it, uh, uh, own uh, real estate in Mexico, other parts of South America, in Canada, Japan, in uh, Europe. And uh, uh, you, you certainly can do that. Love it. Uh, good question. Love it. And uh, our final question for today uh, from Steve, uh, who wants to uh, ask him you to expand on pros and cons of setting up a S Corp versus LLC for your business. Sure. Um, so, so you know, in the Power of Inc., it, it just from a, a, a presentation perspective, the Power Inc. is probably a two-hour presentation just in itself. So, I'll give you the brief rundown from a tax perspective. Uh, as far as entity selection is concerned. If you have a self-employed business, it doesn't necessarily mean that you need to incorporate your business literally from day one. Um, you have to hit certain net profit milestones in order for incorporating to make sense from a tax perspective. Now, if you work in an industry that has high risk and liability, let's say you're starting uh, you know, a medical consulting business where you are actually advising people to take supplements or to do certain exercises, things that could physically injure other people or physically injure your clients, uh, you might want to start an LLC just right out the gate simply from a liability protection standpoint. When the income tax conversation comes into play is as soon as your company consistently hits a milestone net revenue figure consistently, so year over year, at least two years running, when your net revenue hits at least forty to forty-five thousand dollars per year, okay. And at that point, the S corporation. So it's, it, it, even if you've already established an LLC, we would take your LLC and make an S election for the LLC to tax it as an S corporation uh, at forty to forty-five thousand dollars in net profit, because the S corporation is the only entity that will allow you, through through proper planning on the tax tax preparation side is the only entity that will allow you to reduce your self-employment tax by upwards of 60 plus percent, okay? If your net profit is below 40 to $45,000, I doubt that there's a whole lot of risk and liability in what you're doing. There's definitely not gonna be a whole lot of liability paid on a net profit under 40 to 45 grand. So incorporating would probably end up costing you more than what it's saving you. OK, but if you are hitting those consistencies and net net revenue milestones that, that we just discussed, 40 to 45 grand, the incorporation as an S corporation, once again, would significantly reduce your self-employment tax by upwards of 60 percent. And roughly at about forty five thousand dollars net revenue, the tax savings of filing your business as an S corporation ends up being just shy of about six thousand dollars. The reason why I want you to be very particular and very strategical with the incorporation side of things is that I don't want you to jump into an LLC or, or an S corporation, tying yourself into a contractual agreement with the state of California, where you have to pay an annual filing fee to the state uh, of California of $800 every single year. You've got to pay a tax preparer to file the return. That's probably another $800, $900 to $1,000 to file the return. Then you got to run payroll or actually zero payroll throughout the year if you're an S corporation, even if you're not making enough profit to run payroll, that could be very costly, two to three grand minimum per year. And it doesn't make sense for you to incur those costs because your net revenue isn't high enough 
for it to, for the incorporated entity to save you more than all of the costs that you're incurring. So once again, you got to look for those milestone figures to be hit forty to forty five thousand dollars consistently year over year. However, if you are in an industry that runs a very high risk and liability, skydiving instructors, medical practitioners, um, you know, uh, uh, gym trainers. I mean, you know, uh, uh, private drivers. If you're driving your clients, you know, I, I have a, I have a couple limousine companies I do taxes for. There's a lot of risk and liability in what they do, and it doesn't matter. You could have all of the insurance in the world in place to pay out settlements in case an unforeseen event happens. At the end of the day, if insurance doesn't end up paying out the settlement, guess what? They're going to come after all of your eggs sitting in your basket, right? And that's why you want to protect your eggs separately with these incorporated entities simply from a risk and liability standpoint. Uh, but once again, on the tax side, the net revenue has to hit certain milestones in order for it to save you more than it's going to cost you. Like I said, it's a, it's a whole two hour presentation just in itself. But I, I absolutely suggest for you to reach out to one of our senior advisors and dive into more detail about uh, the power of incorporating and whether or not it's right for you. Uh, thanks, Tony. And we actually did uh, uh, that seminar with you. And uh, uh, I believe Steve asked that question. We do have a, a copy of that uh, recorded on our, on our website and our uh, on our YouTube as well. So uh, you can find it there or contact us and we'll uh, send you a link. Well, that concludes it for tonight. Uh, lots of great questions, lots of great information. Uh, I do encourage you to reach out to uh, Robert Hall and Associates for your uh, free consultation. Uh, I've been working with them uh, for many years uh, for my uh, personal and business tax preparation. And the, the result is uh, just uh, probably tens of thousands in, in savings. Uh, so um, you, you definitely want to get a second opinion. Um, thank you, Tony, so much for uh, lots of great information. And uh, we'll see you next time. You got it, Dimitri. Thanks again. Take care, everyone.